Let them praise us, give Jehovah. They were made at his command. Them forever he established. His decree shall ever stand. From the earth, oh, praise Jehovah. All ye floods, ye dragons, all. Fire and hail and snow and vapor, stormy winds that hear him call. Let them praise, Let them praise us, give Jehovah, for his name alone is high. And his, and his glory is exalted. And his glory, and his glory is exalted. And his glory, and his glory is exalted. Exalted far above the earth and sky. Oh, yes, I see a lot of you are like myself, still kind of recovering, mellowing out. It's interesting, you know, I spend almost all my time for the last. 50 years, working with adults. So to go back and work with the little woods is a real difference and a real treat. You find out things from their perspective. And it, it's interesting, to say the least. Okay, we're going through the 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 uh, code here that Christ, uh, Paul laid down, it has to do with Christian living. We've talked about the morality. We've talked about the integrity. We've talked about the the, the why behind it. Uh, and so, we're, as we're moving on. Uh, we're, let's see, let me find the verse for you. Therefore, do not become partners with them. Okay. Yeah, verse 7 of chapter 5. And we're going to kind of go forward from there. Uh, Paul's going to use two concepts rather strongly over the next good while. They're behind everything he's saying. And uh, they're, he keeps bringing them in. Brings one in and brings the other one in. and it, they, they both are there bo all the time. And it's uh, love and respect. Those two things are, are to the motivation that's behind Christian living. If you stop and think about it, it took a lot of love for Christ to come and to be a sacrifice, to redeem us, to, to adopt us. But to do that, he had to know something about us. He had to have a respect for what we could be. If we were just totally lost and nothing we could do about it, then what, why go to the sacrifice? Why redeem a people if there was no hope that they could live up to, to the, the standard of living that's worthy of what we've been called to? But he knew it was there. I think we need to give ourselves more credit than we do sometimes. That we're capable of being better 
than maybe we have been in the past. That past mistakes do not have to to identify us, do not have to be our identity, that we can do better. So as we go on there, uh, do not become partners with them, for you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. As you try to learn what is pleasing to the Lord, do not participate in the useless deeds of darkness, but instead even expose them. For it is disgraceful even to speak of the things that are done by them in secret, but all things become visible when they are exposed by the light. For everything that becomes visible is light. For this reason, it says, Awake, sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Now, does that sound like he's addressing a hopeless situation? He's, he's putting a lot of confidence in our ability to change. But what's he expecting us to do? I know, but there's a, there's a sacrifice we have to make. You know, Christ sacrificed heaven. To come to earth. I mean, just think about it. Here is the Lord of creation. The one whose words created everything, including us. And he comes down to earth and subjects himself to being an infant in the hands of a teenage mother that doesn't know a whole lot about what's going on in rather unsanitary conditions. That's a, that is humility. He's humbling himself. So he gave up a great deal. Now what is it he's asking us to give up? Okay. Sacrifice our own selves. But what does that mean? What does it mean... To come out of darkness and to live in light. Well, he says, carefully determine what pleases the Lord. Does that mean we're always going to please those around us? No. <laughs> kind of, I <I'll> say, <laughs> he's kind of laughing over here and I am too because. What happens when you try to do what's right? Hmm? Yeah, it's a, nobody believes it at first. They're, you're a hypocrite. You couldn't possibly do that. You couldn't possibly be what you say you're going to be. And so it becomes our job to... To prove them wrong. Now, that means we turn away from things. And this is one of the, the really hard things for new converts to, to appreciate. Usually, when somebody is converted to Christ, they, their friends are a mixed bag. There's some that are good. There's some that are not. And... You know, that's just the way society is. If they choose to continue to hang around the ones that are practicing the deeds of darkness, what happens? First thing you know, they're right back in it. But if they turn their backs on those friends, or maybe not maybe an abrupt 
those we're not supposed to insult people or but we just don't go and do those things anymore. They're not happy about it. And so they're they're going to try to get us back and then if they can't get us back by luring us back then they're, they kind of go on the attack to see if they can drive us back. Uh, now, what does this mean? But all things become visible when they're exposed by light. And, and all, before, do not participate in the useless deeds of darkness. Instead, even expose them. How far does the Christian have to go in trying to expose the darkness of our culture. If they're not doing it, we can see that if they're not doing them, then they're exposing what the wrong in which they are doing. All right, by not doing it. By not doing it, that that those things are are dark. Okay. Does it go any further than that? What? There are times you have to speak out. And you should know when you speak out, you're making a target of yourself. But uh, there's a lot of stuff in our society that we have kind of become complacent about. Now, there's a way to speak out about it. And there's a way not to. There are a lot of people that like to Condemn things. It's easier to get on the war path than it is to just live a straight life, isn't it? Because if you're at war with something, what do you do? You get all built up and you strike out and, and you, you do all manner of things. And first thing you know, you're doing things just as bad as what you're 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 condemning. Uh, how do you oppose things like the drug cartels? And don't think they're all down in Mexico. They're right here in Ennis. Uh they were rampant in the Metroplex. How do you try to ensure that you do what everything you can and uh, to try to combat that? Sometimes, that, that's true, sometimes to plant that field and to try to cultivate it and keep it uh, productive instead of just being full of weeds, you have to use different te- techniques. You, you may have to find a different crop, the crop that will grow in that field that where the other crops you'd tried didn't, and that's the reason it was... It was fallow. Uh, when it comes time to creating programs that encourage people to do what's right rather than to fall into the trap of, of what's wrong, God's people can be a little slow. Well, you know, where would you recommend... Someone you know, if they had a, a member of their family, 
I started to say a teenager, but they're not all teenagers. They're 50 years old and whatever. Who becomes addicted to narcotics? Where would you send them for treatment? Hmm? Where is a rehab center that actually operates on Christian principles? See, we don't do that. We don't even do the same kind of job for taking care of the fatherless and the widows we used to do. And, of course, there's a lot of laws that have come into play that all make it more difficult. But just because something becomes difficult, is that a reason not to do it? It's like trying to come up with enough volunteers for VBS. You know, a few years ago, you just put out an appeal. Whoever wanted to come and help, you, you took them. Today, you can't, can you? Today, there's got to be background checks, and there's got to be training that people go through, and all of that stuff that kind of keeps people from wanting to do anything, all because society has put rules and regulations in place that make it harder to do what's right. Well, we just have to buckle down and go ahead and do what's right because just because it's difficult doesn't mean it doesn't need to be done. Okay, let's move ahead here. <laughs> Good question, John. I don't know. If I knew the answer to that, uh, I would have an answer to a whole lot of questions. Because it's so easy to just keep on going like on cruise control. And we become like an old work sock in the laundry. You ever been to watch one of these uh, washing machines that uh, has a glass front on it or a glass top and the uh, laundry's in there with socks and all this stuff and where does it go? Wherever the water pushes it. It's just moving along. Wherever society pushes it, that's where it goes. And so many times, as Christians, that's what we do. Okay, I'm not going to do the bad things. I'm not, not going to cheat. I'm not going to steal. I'm not going to murder anybody. But then as society push, pushes us around, we just push and go, kind of go wherever society goes. We're on cruise control. And we've somehow got to get off of cruise control. And that's really, when we get down to this Roman numeral 4, which was the, the verse that uh, you just tell Sam he missed it. Because here we are. We're down to the verse that, that he wants to wanted us to talk about, and it's one we've talked about a lot in the church, but we haven't necessarily talked about it the way Paul wrote it. Some of the things we try to, to make it a specific on, a proof text on, weren't even problems Paul had. But there were others. Now, so then, be careful how you walk. And what do you, what do you substitute for walk? What, what is, when he says walk, what's he mean? Be careful how you live. Not as unwise people, but as wise. Making the most of your time, because the days are evil. 
Therefore do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk with wine in which there is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody with your hearts to the Lord, always giving thanks for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to our God and Father, and subject yourselves to one another out of fear of Christ. Sometimes that's true, John. Sometimes the most important conversations you have, the conversations you have with yourself, when you convince yourself about what you can do and what you can, can't do. Because what Paul is talking about here is a code of Christian living. You could call it a code of Christian fellowship. But its fellowship is a little broader than what we usually apply it to. It doesn't mean just when we get together to have a, have a meal and, and refreshment, but it includes that. It means everything in our lives. So he's saying, you need to take control of your lives. You need to, to be careful how you live and make sure that what you do in your life is wise. Now, how do you determine if it's wise? If it's... How do we know it's wise? If it's, we've got a standard. All right. Here's the standard. Have we got a list, set of rules to follow? Not so much. We've got some principles, some very good principles that are broad and that tell that will cover everything. The rules don't cover everything. We keep inventing situations that that didn't exist. Paul's not talking about instrumental music in worship here necessarily because it didn't exist. It, uh, what we know of as music did not come along at about six or 700 A.D. So if you look at those churches that try to put their roots far back, and that includes the Restoration Movement where we, while we were kind of new on the block, we had to go back and try to put our roots down. But it includes other groups. Like, you don't find instrumental music in Orthodox churches. Yeah, and uh, all of that. But then... He's not condemning it either. He's talking about what we do with each other. And just because he's not talking about instrumental music and worship, he's not necessarily excluding it either. To say that because he's not talking about the worship service, that means anything goes in the worship service, is to overlook a whole lot of the rest of the New Testament. And... It's just that that's not, not wise either. We're talking about how do we go about living together so that we are encouraging each other and lifting each other up and building each other up so that we do not get led astray. And if we're going to do that, how do we, what has to be included? What part of our lives lie outside of the, the parameters of Christian living? Sure, 
Is that necessarily the way we conduct ourselves, though? What happens on Sunday is one thing, isn't it? What happens Monday through Saturday is something else. And he, this is the one thing you can say he's not allowing here is that kind of separation. He's talking about all of your life being such that you're building each other up. So, what do you think he meant, or how do you think he saw the church and what they did for recreation Monday through Saturday? Well, that's that's part of it, but that's what else? What happens today? We come to church, but then when we go to work, where do we go to work? Out in the world. And we don't we probably not another Christian on the job. If we uh come home in the evening who do we associate? Who comes over for dinner? Who who do we go over to see? It's all separate. Paul didn't see it as being separate. You are together all the time. And one of the things, if we look at the history of the early church that it is really different from the day is they did tend to all be together. They suffered the same problems. They had the same persecutions. But they also had a united front against what was happening to them. They could build each other up because they saw each other. They met together. They did sing together on Monday night or Tuesday night or whenever they happened to be having a good time together. And they talked together. They, they had visits with each other. They had coffee with each other. They had dinner with each other. It was not unusual for them to to all work together in one place. How did the early church spread? One of the, the real secrets that we overlook, we're going to have great campaigns and we're going to go out and reach the lost. They, won, they spread Christianity one by one. Over here, you've got a house. Big house. Unusual, but it's the bottom floor is the store. This is a this is very well represented in, in Corinthians, first Corinthians. Second floor is where you the work is done. Move up to the third floor, and there's all those separate rooms and apartments where the various people live. And there might be 10 or 15 people who all work together, different families that work together in the same trade. The one you see in in 1 Corinthians is tent making, which is a whole lot bigger than just making tents. It's making anything that was needed, called for, out of durable, flexible material that was sewed together. Might be leather, might be canvas, might be felt, uh, might be something like burlap, but they didn't really have burlap in that day. They had uh, the similar things that were made out of the remains of of uh, flax and uh, uh, wool, because cotton. <laughs> Cotton production had not really reached the level that it allowed them to to have the cotton fabrics that they developed a few hundred years later. Uh, 
So here they work together. They weren't, weren't all Christians, but what did they do while they worked? And they talked. And they talked about what they believed. They talked about their lives. They talked about Christ. They talked about what it meant to be a Christian. They talked about the blessings they enjoyed in Christ. So here's this guy that came in from whatever, who was a skilled tent maker, could handle the needles of all of the materials and stuff, but he's never heard of God. He goes to work with the, these bunch of Christians who are working for uh, some, somebody like Aquila, who happened to be a tent maker and was uh, one of the traveling tradesmen, the secret weapon of the early church. So here he is. They, you bring him in. He's, he's next to people who are Christians, who are telling them about their lives and about the blessings they have in Christ. After time, what do you think happens? Hmm? He wants to be a part of that because that's better than what he came from. You know, right across town in another building is a bunch of tent makers working together who are all heathens. And he sees the two, and he compares the two. And uh, like John said, good news sells. Bad news doesn't. Good news is having a good life and, and being able to, to enjoy life. Feel good about yourself. Know your, your family is, is good and safe. You know, you may face uh, problems with the government. You may face problems with... Some of your neighbors are not very friendly, but uh, in the church, you have fellowship. You go to church, you worship together, you praise God together, you sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs together. You're united in one heart, one spirit. So what do you do in the next week when you get a problem? Somebody presents you with a, an opportunity to do something that you aren't sure about. What do you do? Talk to those people you're close to and fellow Christians do what for fellow Christians? Yes, and together they were able to make a decision about the things the rule didn't cover. Jim, don't you think there's a lot of this here? It's talking about how you feel in your heart. If you don't feel it in your heart, Bill, you will not live it out with with uh, Fanny or Bob or anybody else. Yeah. If you don't want to do that, then he says, be filled with the Holy Spirit, singing songs and hymns and spiritual songs among yourselves and making music to the Lord in your heart. So, really, this is... A lot of it is internal. That's true. You can't, and you've got to feel it internally if you're going to express it one with another. Not only feeling, you have to be. You have to be. Now, they had a choice. And, uh, you know, drinking sure wasn't an, uh, an unknown. Most of these people had been heavy drinkers. It's like most of our, our culture in the past, that's, that's very much a part of our culture growing up in the West. You know, you wanted to, you wanted to know what was going on in town? Where'd you go? Local saloon. 
uh, that's where business was conducted. That's where life went on. And Paul said, hey, if you go that way, you're going to be led astray. That's where your heart's going to be. That's what's going to lead you to debauchery. But, if you fill your heart with the Holy Spirit, and that's up to you, believe me. The Holy Spirit's not going to force the door open and force its way in. You have to be willing to submit to, to what He's leading you to do. But when you, you do submit, He comes in and He gives you the same kind of good feeling that apparently drunks get from drinking. I mean, they must get something out of it besides a hangover. I never was particularly drawn to it because I just can't stand the taste of the stuff. Uh, but, uh, you know, I also made the decision that if you ever got a hangover and a sinus headache at the same time, it probably proved fatal. <laughs> so I didn't want to do that. <laughs> didn't want to take that chance. <coughs> But well, what do you think? <clears throat> that means for us here in the 21st century, what do we need to do as a church to try to make sure that we walk wisely, led by the Holy Spirit, and feel the joy and the, the, the comes from having this, the Holy Spirit as a part of our lives. What do we need to do today that we may not be doing? Yes. You know, I think, I can't prove this because I haven't taken time, haven't had time to study it. I think one of the worst things that ever happened for Christianity was the Industrial Revolution. Because what did it do? Well, it got everybody to the big cities, but they were already living in big cities, com comparatively speaking. There were some uh, churches that were ruled. In fact, one of them was a spinoff from what Paul had done in Ephesus. And he's going to write a letter to the guy. And we're going to talk a lot about him when we talk about this next part, which is the relationship code, or the code of how to get along with all the different people in your life or in your family. Uh, we, uh, I don't remember now what I was going to say. It was a good idea, I assure you. <laughs> well, yeah, the Industrial Revolution separated work from the home. All of a sudden, instead of cottage industries and families working together, dad goes off to the factory to earn a living. The families left on their own at home separate sets of uh, temptations, separate sets of problems. So the first thing you know, the thing that takes the first hit is the family. And then the family, it, once the family splits, what happens to involvement in the church? Takes a tumble, goes away. The church is not real appreciative of people whose families have have taken a, a tumble, that have gone apart, been torn apart. Well, part of it, the influence of working outside the home is you face a whole different set of, of, of temptations that you don't face when you're working at home. Well, we're not going to ch change that. We're not going to go back and get rid of the factories. 
because they are really more efficient in producing goods and services. We're not going to revolutionize that part. You want to go back and live like the Amish, you can. Now, I don't know that that's wrong, but I know that you're probably not going to make it that way. Most people don't. Even most Amish don't. They lose about 50% of their kids every year during the wilding years when they are allowed to make a choice. Uh, but if we do gather together, if we make a point to get together as the body of Christ more often, not the whole body, maybe, because most of the time they didn't have any place that the whole body came together. They have 10, 15 people, maybe 20 were about as many as the, any of those places would hold. You get over to Philemon, who's the guy I was talking about, and he was a farmer. He was one of the upper crust of Roman society. He, he was an estate owner. And uh, he had the church that met his family. That church might have been 50 or 75 people. But uh, that was the uh, uh, exception rather than the rule. The rule was the small house church that still identified with all the others that are, were of like mind in the city. And uh, if they had elders, they were over the city. All the different house churches in the city. Okay, enough of that. Let's see what time it is getting to be. It's time. Okay. Next week, we're going to start out on this relationship or what many authors refer to as the, the household code. The, a point I need to make before we ever get there. Many writers in the first century wrote about these codes of, of conduct like Paul's doing. They wrote about uh, integrity and morality, and they wrote about the family. But their orientation was all, this is the way you do this in order to gain more wealth, be happier personally, or to make a stronger empire. Paul is the only one that, ha we have, that his writings have survived that wrote a code of conduct that was for Christian living, for spiritual enhancement. So we'll attack it from that standpoint. See you next week. Start with verse 21. It goes through chapter 6, verse 9.